Tip today with Fran Curry. With Slattery's Garage, puck on. Your Peugeot car or van might benefit from a free software upgrade. For more information and to find out if this applies to your vehicle, call the lads in Slattery's Garage, puck on on 067 24111 or slatterysgarage.ie. Thanks, Pat. Welcome back to the final hour of Tip Today. Now, as you know, and Pat brought it uh, to you there during the news bulletin as well, um, Deputy Jackie Cahill of uh, Fianna Fáil has decided on personal grounds following health advice not to put his name forward in the upcoming uh, election. Uh, we're hearing from uh, Deputy Alan Kelly uh, this morning as well, and uh, in a statement he says, uh, I'd like to pay tribute to the contribution that Jackie made during his time as a TD and public representative for Fianna Fáil. He was a collegiate colleague of mine for the last nine years. He was always advocating for his constituency and a passionate voice on agriculture and rural Ireland issues um, where we share common ground. Political life is a very demanding one and uh, I'm sure this decision wasn't an easy one. So I wish Jackie health and happiness and all the best for the future. Now, also uh, a letter in, and it says, Fran, I'm at my wit's end. I was listening to Joe this morning, and fair play to him. That's young uh, Joe Hawkins of Ellen Park in Clan Mill. And uh, this uh, listener goes on to say, but the level of litter in Tipperary at the moment is shocking. What uh, particularly riling me up is the chewing gum and the vape stickers that are on every bin right across the county. And frankly, it's disgusting. During COVID, we spent so much time being obsessed with cleanliness and hygiene. We seem to have forgotten all of that now. On that note, I've seen so many people throwing litter out of their car windows with no shame. They do not care who is watching. What is the point of us uh, fighting for our localities and asking for resources when we can't even keep the place clean? Paper bags filled with fast food uh, lining all of our roads. Our towns are becoming dirty and smelly and I've seen um, too many men relieving themselves on our corners and pavements after a night in the pub. We need to have respect for our gorgeous towns and villages. Please tell me I'm not the only person seeing these issues from an irritated but proud Tipperary native. Only three, three double one, double three, double one. Legal discussion on Tip Today is brought to you in association with Lynch Solicitors Clan Mel on the web at lynchsolicitors.ie and at divorceinireland.com. John Lynch is with me in the uh, studio. Good morning to you, John. You, you're cycling around the place and also. Do you, do you see a lot of littering, John? Do you see? Uh, I see more cars for sure. Yeah. That's the one thing that I've certainly noticed over the last while. More cars on the road? Much more cars on country back country roads than I. You know, I mean, I'm cycling for over 15 years now but around the county and I certainly find more cars do I find more litter not on country roads but on certain roads if you know what I mean yeah um, is it the usual stuff the, the, the fast food containers and out the window coffee on the way home at night kind of stuff and then sometimes you come across the but no I wouldn't say I'm finding any more right. and you know from around the cycling around the country country roads no I don't see any more than I've seen in the past. I haven't right. seen a, a huge uplift in it. Let's, you come across something really strange every now and then. That somebody's actually discarded a bag of rubbish and thrown it in over the ditch and that, that kind of really surprises you as to why somebody might do that. A but friend of mine from, from Nina, he was able to mathematically work out how long it takes to eat a pizza from a certain venue in the town of Nina uh, as drivers go went out a certain rural road because it was you know after a certain number of miles the thing was discarded but there was lots discarded so he worked out how he many miles it takes to, to, eat to eat a pizza <laughs> <laughs> which I always thought was very did he work out the numbers of people <laughs> occupants in the car and how long and whether that had varied I think knowing the guy in question he's probably, probably working, has, yeah, working yeah, probably at that has. at the moment yeah. when, when last we spoke we were talking about contesting wills there was a big lot of interest in that John yeah, there always is. Um, it's always very topical. Funny, uh, and the other thing that's always very topical as well that's kind of crossed my desk in the last few weeks uh, to do with wills and succession planning and planning for the future, which is one of my hot pet subjects at the moment. You know, the whole idea of succession planning and doing it properly and trying to plan it before you, you know, try and plan it, basically. 
but uh, the other one is the changes that that are that they've put in under the the, the budget the budget changes that have come in and there's a huge amount of comment now about a small little change it's a very small change but it has it seems to be very significant or it could be very significant on agricultural relief mm-hmm. where they've uh put the requirement on both sides of the equation, both the person getting the inheritance and the person giving the inheritance, and now they've put in this requirement, the farmer test, on both sides of the equation because, again, some, uh, I would say, forward-looking might be one way of looking at it, but um, planner, tax planners, would obviously avail of those reliefs for people who weren't, strictly speaking, Farmers, if you know what I mean, in the conventional sense, and therefore somebody came up with the bright idea that well, this is we'll we'll block this particular avenue, but of course, in blocking that avenue, then you have a lot of legitimate situations where people might have been out farming for the five years prior to the because they might have been ill or in a nursing home or for whatever reason, and that has caused and is has is going to cause an amount of difficulty. And again, it kind of prompts... Like, the budget always brings... accelerates planning, funnily enough. Mm. Not funnily enough, and not unsurprising that it accelerates it. And it often impacts on stamp duty and threshold... stamp duty thresholds. So that used to be the conventional one. But you have this uh, mad dash... Maybe not a mad dash, but you have a dash to try and do things. So it's good and bad, obviously, mm. if you don't do it. There's, there's always unintended consequences oh, to, yeah. to a lot of these oh, yeah. decisions. Then. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, can you do something about it? Yeah. Um, but yes, you can. You have until January to do something about it. So it kind of prompts people uh, that if they are going to, if they're in a situation where they should be looking at succession, which we, sh- we should all be looking at it mm. at a certain age, obviously. But now is the time to look at it because if they make the change and you're caught by the change in next year, well then it's too late to do something about it. But you do have between here now and the end of the year. So I would counsel people to have a look at it from that perspective. Now they've upped as well. I mean, they've done a couple of things. They've upped the thresholds for for inheritances anyway. Mm. So at least they have upped them. Uh, how dramatic an uplift, I suppose, is relative, if you know what I mean. But they have up, they have lifted that because a lot of people, again, you're always very afraid coming into afraid being, again, maybe too strong a word, but you're always, you know, you always have to deal with the with the fact that mm. if you do change the thresholds, it's going to affect your your ability to deal with your succession planning. So worthwhile people keeping an eye on that one. For um, sure. And uh, lots coming in for you as well. Uh, one, one of the things that came in, and it's something you've spoken quite a lot about over over the years, John, rights mm. of way. Mm. And I, I think somebody was questioning, because there was a historic right of way on, on their mm. land, they're wondering, can they put a stop to it, can I suppose? Can they do anything about it? Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, the... You may remember that, uh, well, I don't exactly expect that people would remember the detail of it, but they introduced a change in uh, in conveyancing acts when they kind of reformed them. And one of the reforms that they introduced was they said that they would kind of put a 12-year stop. Now, what I mean by that is that in all areas of law, the question often comes up that, it can't be indefinite. You can't have an indefinite period to sue somebody. So you introduce what they call the statute of limitations. So it limits the time frame within which you can do something. So what they did in the Convincing Reform Act was they introduced a 12-year period and said that after 12 years, uh, well, first of all, that you had to register right away. And if you didn't register right away, you may lose it. So if you don't register, you lose it. So that caused huge furore and eventually at the last minute was postponed. So, And in that, they also had a provision in the Act that said that if you didn't use it for 12 years, you'd lose it. So, you know the old phrase, use it or lose mm-hmm. it? Well, mm. this is what they were introducing. So they were kind of trying to put a stop to, you know, and as you can imagine, if you walk again, if you're cycling around the county, which I'm sure you'd be delighted to do, you can All look, the time. you can see a load of, you know, you'll often see kind of semi-abandoned 
accesses through fields and things, which could have been a right of way that is or isn't being And many a row has had about those rights of way. Somebody buys the land and suddenly opens up the right of way that hadn't been used for a period of time. So this was an effort to address that, but it it was suspended. So there, so therefore, to answer the question about can you abandon right away? Well, again, that has fallen back on case law, and it's fallen back on can you prove you can you prove in a court of law that it has in fact been abandoned? And the kind of criterion, or the criteria, should I say, for and as a kind of a general, would it go into all the detail of it? Is that you have to kind of prove an intention to abandon? So you have to prove. So how would you do that? Well, you do it over by looking at how long has it been abandoned? Has it been used intermittently? You know, is there alternative accesses and are they being mm. used on a permanent basis? Is there an obstruction on the right way? You know. Like, for example, is it overgrown? Has it been overgrown for years and things like that? They're all the evidential uh, pieces of evidence that you bring right. into play. Well, I, I in think I may have it. read something different into the question. I, I thought this may have been an active right of way that people were using, and the person who owns the land is wondering, can I stop this now? Well, no, yeah, the straight answer is no, you no. can't. Right. Uh, and that's an easy one to answer because it's a bit like the same question. You know that I've been asked on any number of years and over the years, can I move it? You know, could I move it out of the way, oh, yeah. left or right, so that it suited me? Which, if you can think about it, which will often come into play. For example, if you have a right of way through properties that you're buying a number of properties, and there's a right of way running right through them, and you want to develop all of the properties, so that would have been a common enough question: Can I move it? Can I take the right of way out of there and move it to there? Well, the answer is you can't without the agreement of the person who has the right. So that's the straight answer to that question. But often where the row is is whether it's been abandoned. Yes. And that's where... And and when you spoke about... I know it didn't work out, but when you spoke about that notion of registering the right of way, is it the person who uses the right of way that they wanted to register or is it the landowner? The person who wants to use it, right, registers it. it. But I mean, but the point about that is registration has the effect of of formalising it and making it a lot more difficult to argue about abandonment. Okay. And there's a whole much, there's a much higher uh, threshold in proving abandonment of a registered right away than a non-registered right away. Okay. And the whole idea of this act was to try and tidy it up in a way because you could, I mean, whatever about the field, is John B. Keane, the field, I mean, the amount of... Um, litigation that there's been about rights away is and funny it's one of the areas and I better be careful here that I don't uh, publicize my knowledge or but it's one of the areas that I kind of specialized in for a period of time during covid and I would have spent uh, innumerable hours on webinars for all over the country and even to the extent that I used to get queries from the UK for people who for some reason either and you can make up your own mind on why they didn't figure out that it was an Irish-based website, but uh, queries from people all over the UK at one point, and I was trying to wonder, how in the name of God did they, would they not figure? But obviously they read the article, and there was an article that I wrote, and that kind of, when I say went viral, it was very, it would come up very frequently on a search. So that, that was the reason, which kind of, uh, interestingly enough, leads you into the other question about expertise. You know, it was certainly an area, and it is an area that I, I've had a lot of experience of and dealt mm. with a lot. But it's this whole thing about it on the internet, because an article that I wrote uh, a number of years ago keeps coming up on a search, then people consider that you're an expert. Which is really interesting, if it isn't it just because it's isn't one it article just? and it it, it peaks. Well, let, let me ask the as- expert a question then. No, I, mean, I it, didn't. <laughs> I prefaced it by saying. <laughs> I, I mean that tongue in cheek, <laughs> but but I mean if there is a right of way running through my land, mm. for example, and if somebody is using it on a regular basis, yeah. and something happens to them, insurance. Yeah, but is that my insurance then? Will can they sue me? Well. There, that's a very interesting question because that's a very common one that comes up. Is there an obli- What are the obligations 
by the person who owns the land over which you have the right of way yes. and what are the obligations by the person who's exercising the right of way and it, it's very because it, not only does it deal with somebody has an accident over it and and or what happens about the whole area of maintaining the right of way and it's all muddled up if you think about it because it depends on the condition of the right of way it depends on the circumstances of the accident it depends on how many people are using the right of way it depends on what gave rise to the accident like it's it's a multifaceted question uh, which I wouldn't even right. But start. has that has that come up? Oh, uh, yeah. very frequently. Has it? And my answer is always the same: right. insure it. Okay. You know, if if you own it, insure it. Insure it. Just insure the risk. Now, the risk, like obviously, the risk, and again, it's an interesting area because you have to ask the question: on what basis would a court look at who's the person? that they can attribute the responsibility to. And and without going into the nitty-gritty of it, it often comes down to who controls the right of way. So in other words, who's the prim- primary controller? So for example, if you're the landowner and you're removed from the right of way and it's in- exclusively used by the people who have the right of way and you don't use it, so in other words, you don't have a field at the end of it, that you you use this as access for. So there's a whole load of variables that will depend on where the liability lies. But at the end of the day, anybody who's using it right away, you would make sure that your insurance, that you would would cover it in your insurance. Same way as if you have an avenue coming up your house Mm. through like a field and either left and right owned by somebody else, you know, and you owned the avenue, you would insure it as part of your property because it's it's an access point. Interesting. I have loads of questions here for you. I'm not sure. Do you want to go into some some that you have there? Because we seem to have two different Somebody well well no we've only two questions because I'm I'm trying to be responsible and respond to the questions that were asked first. Yes. So we started with a number of questions, which the first one we'll come back to because it raised a whole load of other questions. The right away one we've just dealt with, mm-hmm. and the simple answer is, if it's a, if it's if by historic right away you mean one that's registered, obviously you get one answer to that. If it's an unregistered right away that's been used over a period of time, well, again, it depends on the variables that I'm talking about. Mm. The other question somebody asked was, I men- I mentioned AI. My my another one of my little pet topics, right. but somebody was basically talking about it was artificial intelligence now as opposed to uh, yeah as opposed to the other one seven nation. yeah <laughs> <laughs> no that's not a pet hobby of mine but anyway. <laughs> the can you ask what one's legal rights are if you find that somebody's used an image and the answer to that I suppose putting it as very simplest is you're into the area of copyright yeah. And if you're into the area of copyright law, you're also into the area of privacy law, you're also into the area of data protection. And when you look at these different elements that you're looking at, and then you're also into the area of where does the responsibility lie if it's social media. And that's a very interesting area because if you if you go on copyright simpliciter, I mean, copyright... Now, I'm assuming that, you know, you're talking about using an image... Um, that somebody either an image uh, like the, obviously there's the image of yourself i.e. a photograph and or there's images that you might create artistically now obviously if it's an artistic image and it's unique to you well then obviously you have a copyright you have an ownership of it mm-hmm. and if somebody breaches that then the question is what happens there well obviously you can prevent them from, from doing it that's number one so you can get them to stop doing it number two you can get them to release it back to you um, which is an interesting one, depending on what kind of an images that you're talking about. And the other, the other thing, obviously, if it's a social platform, you can get the provider to remove it from the platform. And then, obviously, if the whole area of damages come into comes into play, so if they're if they made a gain out of it, mm-hmm. if they made money out of it, then obviously you can go. And then there's the pure and simple, because again, when you're dealing in law and particular areas like this, there's the whole question, is there damages payable if there's no damage? And that's a really interesting area because what I mean by that is that if there's a data breach, for example, if if your image gets released uh, and somebody is supposed to be holding it and, you know, under data protection that's mm. supposed to release it 
is there is there are there damages payable by the release simpliciter in yes. other words that there was no particular ill effect and be that an image or be that data now obviously and there's huge debate about that as to what extent of compensation is payable and mm. there's because it comes in under EU law then the general thrust of it is there's some compensation payable at the moment but whether there should or shouldn't be is 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 open to debate where there's no proof yeah. of actual there's damage. Some, there's some debate as well around if you take a core image and you manipulate it in yes. some way or mm. you enhance it or mm. you edit mm. it or, or whatever it becomes fresh it becomes yeah. something new that's unique. That's unique to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I know that that's debatable at the but moment. But of course it is, and yeah. it's a bit like, was it My Sweet Lord? Was that the song? Yes, George Harrison. George yeah. Harrison's song. Yeah. And I remember playing the two of them at the time, thinking they were very similar. Mm. But you know, and again, that's often comes down to the to the evidence yeah, and yeah. interpretation of it. But it raises a lot of really interesting questions now in the whole area of AI, obviously, mm. because, funny, I was having a conversation with somebody um, who's a software engineer in the area of um, music and installations, etc. you know, that whole artistic area. Yes. And I was asking him, I said, how has AI impacted on it? And he said the problem with it is exactly the one that you've just mentioned, i.e. that with AI, they can come in and they can use AI to generate something that looks somewhat, but maybe not, mm. the same as. And it's really, really difficult. Now, obviously, his observations on the artistic merit or otherwise is a completely different mm. discussion. Mm. So whether, whether what was generated was would qualify, if you know what I mean. But it is really, really interesting, yes, just, as yeah. you said, the finer... And it's, it is always that. It's always that fine line between, you know, original and what is and what is not, and a slight little tweak, which brings it onto the whole area of plagiarism. I, I, I think the courts are going to be stuffed with this stuff so, yeah. over the next uh, I think so. and, generation, and like, you know? But yeah, and interestingly enough, it's like so many areas that are new areas. Uh, I always remember being involved in a case that involved way back, it was the early, on, the early starting point of um, accounts being put online, mm. you know, uh, what am I Com uh, computerised accounts. Mm. God, it took me a while to get on. But computerised accounts. And I remember being at a webinar and there was a whole debate. It was like everything else. I mean, you smile when you, when you go back to it, where the argument was, well, you don't really need computerised accounts. What would you be doing with computerised accounts? Sure, you know, uh, you know, manual are just as good. Yeah. But of course, at that time, you were spending a lot. It was costing a lot to get the computerised account. Now they cost absolutely nothing, so everybody has them. But, I mean, the interesting thing from from our discussion here is that if you're going into that it becomes really inexpensive to do all this, mm. then you're into an area where it's going to be everybody and anybody is going to be using it. And will we now be saying that there is no such thing as originality? Is there no... And how do you determine what's original and what's not? Well, it, it, it's an ongoing discussion, but I happen to believe when I'm at my most optimistic is that the human spirit and the human artistic ability and all that will, will sort of prevail in some way. Well, I was, use it as a yeah, tool. To well, my, my current reading material, other than legal stuff, is the book by uh, Humanology by the professor in Trinity. I can't think of his name. I should, but it's a fascinating book about humanity and you know, originality, and mm. will we be taken over by, mm. you know, whatever? It's not, go, it's not going to happen. I no, think, no, I think no. we'll prevail. Well, I'm, I'm. If 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 somebody comes in there an AI, you'll know the difference. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, John. Thanks Thank very you. much indeed, uh, John Lynch. There, Lynch solicitors in Clan We'll take a break. Back with some conspiracy files in just a moment. Tip FM's Tip Today with Fran Curry In association with Slattery's of Pecan, Tipperary's main Peugeot dealer. Slattery's Garage Pecan, the name you can trust for over 50 years in the Premier County. Slattery'sGarage.ie 